So our first speaker this evening is Alexandra Zur. Is that that is correct? You are first, aren't you, Alexandra? Yes, good. From the Alfred Wagner Institute um, at the Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research. Um, she works as a research associate. Um, she has a passion for paleoclimatology and the polar regions with a specific interest in better understanding the processes causing climate signals that are stored in ice sheets. She's part of the Apex International and co-chairs Apex Germany. Um, and she's currently um, working on a build up of climatic signal in the upper snowpack at East Grip in the Greenland ice sheet. So would you like to share your um, screen, Alexandra? Yes. Fantastic, thank you. So for screen mode. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction and uh, also welcome from my side. I'm very happy to start today's seminar series. Um, as introduced, I'm a research associate, so I'm currently between PhD and postdoc, somewhere in between. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the buildup of the climatic signal in the upper snowpack at the Greenland ice sheet at the East Grip site. Um, I'm not going to introduce the whole theory why we use stable water isotopes to reconstruct temperatures from ice cores. Um, but the basic principle is that we have a transfer function between the temperature in the atmosphere and what we then record in the ice cores. Um, and that is temperature dependent. And that's why we can uh, just use this information and to go to ice cores and reconstruct glacial interglacials, warm and cold periods. Um, and on a long term scales, it fits really well. But if we want to look at um, the short term scales, we have to better understand how the climatic signal is actually imprinted. And that's the motivation of the study. So let's uh, drive into it. Imagine you're standing on an ice sheet like the Greenland ice sheet, for example. And as we can see here, it's basically pretty flat. We have sometimes some sastrugis or surface roughnesses, but in principle, it's flat. And then we have snowfall from time to time, but we also have a lot of wind. So if the snow is then redistributed by wind, we can just imagine that it looks more like this, the surface. So we have some ups and downs, as truly dunes and troughs, so just some heterogeneity. And then if we assume that um, the snowflakes are recording a temperature signal, then this whole look could look like this, that uh, the red snowflakes are um, recording warmer temperatures and the blue snowflakes recording colder temperatures. And we actually know from studies that the top meters of the snow also are very heterogeneous. It's not just a layer of cold winter and then warm summer snow, but there are spots where the winter layer is missing or the summer layer is missing or the thicknesses are different. Um, and this leads to the question, what processes are influencing the temperature signal until it becomes a proxy signal in um, ice cores. Um, so we know that for stable water isotopes, it's spatially very variable and heterogeneous. And if you convert that to what we actually record on temperatures on ice sheets, like what we have here on the right hand side from an automatic weather station, um, we see that the automatic weather station has the nice yearly cycles, but we don't see that anymore in the water isotopes, even if we average um, that's just happening by diffusion. So there are more processes um, happening within the fern. And also just the structure as the snow surface itself, um, which is called stratigraphic noise, is influencing how the signal is deposited. And besides all these more physical parts which are happening in the snow, uh, we also have processes which are happening between the snow surface and the atmosphere, like for example, sublimation, which is shown here in a graph that if the snow is exposed to um, dry air and sunny conditions, then we also have sublimation happening. So an exchange between the atmosphere, which is also influencing the signal. So what did we do to really study what processes are influencing our signal? We went to the Greenland ice sheet to the East Grip campsite, which is located here in the map, and we combine um, a photogrammetry structure of motion approach with spatially um, snow sampling schemes. 
So from May to July in 2019, uh, we deployed this camera setup, which we were just dragging along this 40 meter transect every day, recording pictures to generate digital elevation models of the snow surface that we can really know and understand where had snow accumulation uh, occurred and where was it redistributed or eroded in the end. And in the same area, we also took 30 centimeter of snow profiles every two meter every second week. So we have for this 40 meter um, of transect where we have our elevation models, we also have every two meters, so in total 20 snow profiles throughout these two months periods. Um, one thing which I have to mention, which is important for later, is that if we went from once one snow sampling to the next, we had to move a bit towards the wind direction because we cannot really sample the same spot again and again. Um, and that is, of course, causing some variability, but we are accounting for that. So let's start with the snow height information, which we can uh, generate from the digital elevation models. This is, for example, one digital elevation model for one um, time of the season. On the x-axis, we have the 40 meter of the transect. And on the y-axis, is it's just the, the two-dimensional view of this area. And we can see that we have some dune structures here, which are um, filled with troughs in between. And we can then compare this uh, 2D model for uh, throughout the season. Um, which we can see here. So again, on the x-axis are the 40 meter of the transect, and on the y-axis is just some uh, the snow height with an arbitrary zero level. Um, the thick blue line is the snow height on the first day of our observation period, and the thick yellow line is the snow height on the last day of our observation period. And the color code just um, indicates from May to July how the snow surface developed. Um, and what we can see is that we had on some days snowfall events, which brought a lot of snow. And then we also had erosion, um, which was mainly driven by, by wind. Um, and we also see that we didn't have snowfall every day. So we don't have a recording every day. So um, precipitation is temporally variable. We have accumulation intermittency, which means that um, snowfall is not homogeneously deposited at each spot, but we have some spots of um, the position and some spots which do not really get snow to position like the, the dune structure here. And overall, we have stratigraphic noise. So we have um, a dune and a surface roughness structure, uh, which is worn down during the summer season, but eventually it might also build up again during the winter season. So what we can say in, in as a first step is that snowfall brings basically the information. Um, as a next step, we can have a look at the stable water isotopes from the snow profiles, which I'm showing here. We go from um, the first sampling in the end of May to the last sampling two months later in the end of July. And here I'm averaging across the 20 profiles. Um, and what we can see is that we see that we have a winter signal here in about like eight centimeter depth on the first sampling day. And we can see that this is at vector downwards throughout the season, which is what we would expect because we had uh, more snow accumulation on top and because it was summer season, our signal gets uh, less negative, so warmer to say. So snowfall brings the in information which is modified and imprinted in the surface snow. Now we have the information from our high resolution digital elevation models on the snow height and we have the spatial um, resolution of the stable water isotopes, which we can now combine. Um, this is a complex figure and I'm gonna walk you through. So what we can see here is on the x-axis, again, the 40 meter of the transect and on the y-axis, the relative snow height. And in the color code is the stable water isotopic composition, which can be seen as uh, representative for temperature if we want. Um, with blue colors, more the winter signal and the red and yellow colors are representing more the summer signal. And we go from end of May to the end of July, our six sampling days throughout the season. And in black, I am showing always the relative snow height of each sampling day. And additionally, here in the gray line, I'm showing the snow height from the first day that we can actually see what kind of, how much snow accumulation was deposited on top and what kind of uh, signal this snow then had. <clears throat> 
So if we look at the first day of sampling in the end of May, um, we see that we have in most profiles a winter signal, so in a blue color code. Um, but we can also see that this um, winter bar is has a different vertical extent depending on the profile where we are. So we can be here and then we have about 20 centimeter of winter signal, but if we just go a couple of meters to the side, there is no recording of the winter signal at all. Um, and because we have the higher resolution information on the snow height, we can also infer that if we would go to different spots and sample in, different, in the same depth, we would have different signals just because of the, um, of the surface topography. On the other hand, we can also see that this winter signal is kind of persistent throughout the season. So in each of our sampling um, intervals, we still see this winter signal. So it's not completely diffused as you might expect because diffusion is quite strong. What we then can, al can also see from our information about the evolution of the snow height is that if you compare the snow height from the first day of sampling to what was accumulated on top of it, that we can actually see what we expect is that we have um, the position of a summer signal, which is more in the yellow colors um, indicated here. But we can also see similar as for the winter signal that some spots received uh, like up to 10 centimeter of summer signal, while if you just go a couple of meters next to it, um, there's no recording of the summer signal at all. So this confirms that we have a high spatial variability, but it also says that the snowfall which comes with uh, the information which comes with the snowfall is a vector to deeper layers in the end. Um, in the beginning, I said that we had to move every time uh, about 20 to 30 centimeter if we went from one sampling spot to the next. So what we see here could also just be a spatial pattern because we have high variability and we had to move. Um, so I also want to compare what kind of signal would we actually expect. And this is a similar plot. It's shown the same um, temporal sampling intervals and the same snow height information. And what we compare here is that we look at each depth cell where we had a sample and we compare the residual of this mean of this specific depth cell to see where we had significant changes. And if you look at the color code, then it's just the residual of each um, depth cell and the black um, boxes are then showing where we had significant change more than what we assume from just spatially going from one spot to the next. And we can see that most of the changes are, occur close to the surface. And if we are at a depth of like 10, 15 centimeter, they are not that strong or there are no significant changes anymore. Um, this could hint that we have a strong exchange processes between the snow and the atmosphere above. So sublimation, metamorphism, um, processes which are determined by the latent heat flux. Um, but because our sample resolution is not temporally and spatially high enough, we cannot really infer many information from here, but there are other studies doing that. Um, so um, this information then tells us that the information which comes with snowfall is modified and imprinted in the surface snow and vector to deeper layers where it then builds the signal in the snowpack. So coming to my initial question, what processes are influencing the proxy signal between the initial temperature signal and our proxy signal in the end is that we have seen that we have a precipitation weighting of the initial temperature signal. So the timing, the duration, and the seasonality of precipitation are determining when we have a signal input. And from the elevation models, we see that we have also accumulation intermittency. So we have modifications of the snow surface before it actually finally settles. We then have the stratigraphic noise, so just the local surface roughness and the surface features, such as dunes and sastrugi, which determine where we have snow accumulation and therefore also where we have actually an input of the temperature signal. And then we have diffusion within the snow, but also exchange between the snow and the atmosphere, which are also influencing what kind of proxy signal or the same water isotopic signal in this case is then actually imprinted in the snow. So to sum up my work and um, this presentation, 
Um, I showed that combining snow head information and isotopes is a powerful approach to study the deposition, but also the exchange processes. Um, the isotopic changes close to the surface might be related to isotope diffusion, which we could not uh, infer with the study setup. Um, and for that, we would need a sp smaller spatial variation in isotope data, but we already know now the spatial variability in the isotopes, which is already a huge step. And further insights into the depositional modifications are potentially possible via the access. So sublimation and metamorphism can be studied with that. And overall, we saw that the snowfall brings the information which is modified and imprinted in the surface now advected to deeper layers and at some point not affected anymore just by no more normal film diffusion. And with that, I hope I'm in time and uh, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much indeed. So we t usually leave questions to the end if, if that's all right. Um, so we'll move on. Um, so if people have um, questions and they think they won't be able to remember them, if you can pop them into the chat, that's fine. But otherwise we'll collect questions for all the speakers um, at the end. So our um, second speaker today is Sean Peters. Um, he's at the Naval Postgraduate School um, in the Department of Physics and Space Physics group. Um, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Physics. His research focuses on developing passive radar systems. Uh, and signal processing techniques that use ambient radio emissions as signals as of, of opportunity for Earth and planetary radar remote sensing, such as passive remote sen uh, radar sensing of glaciers. And his talk uh, for us today is going to be entitled Passive Radar Investigations for Terrestrial and Planetary Radio Glaciology. So pass over to you, um, Sean. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh for the introduction. Yes, I will be talking about my work to develop passive radar sounding for terrestrial and planetary glaciology. Uh, I'm an assistant professor. I just finished my first year as an assistant professor at the Neo Postgraduate School of Department of Physics. Uh, and in this talk, I will be specifically looking at how we can use ambient radio emissions, such as the Sun and Jupiter's radio emissions, to study, uh, say, the subsurface processes of glaciers, uh, both on Earth and perhaps the icy moons of Jupiter. And the reason I'm interested in this problem, so as a radar systems engineer, uh, I'm really interested in developing low resource remote sensing techniques. You know, since World War II, radar has been adapted and extended to look at a wide range of environmental monitoring situations, such as looking at sea ice, aerosols in the atmosphere. Uh, but for the focus of this talk, I'll be looking at how we can use radar and radar sounding for studying glaciers uh, in the cryosphere, especially in Greenland and Antarctica. The reason I'm interested in this problem is because when we think about actually contributions to sea level rise, that really is one of the greatest challenges that our society will face in the next century. If you look at models predicting sea level rise out to the year 2100, you see that there's a large range of uncertainty in sea level rise predictions. So it's really important that we can advance technologies that observe the processes, conditions, and physics that govern ice sheet behavior, uh, as this is critical to projecting their sea level rise contributions. Now, the way we currently monitor uh, the conditions beneath and within polar ice sheets is by using airborne radar sounding, shown on the left. So an airborne radar sounder will create a bunch of flight lines over, say, Antarctica, transmitting powerful electromagnetic pulses, receiving the echoes coming from below, and then using this as it goes across these flight lines to create radar grams of Antarctica's subsurface. So in this case, you're looking at a radar gram showing the surface, internal layers, as well as bedrock which gives us an idea of ice thickness measurements and the basal conditions as this airborne radar sounder is flying along its flight path. So using these airborne radar sounders, we can obtain extensive spatial coverage of Antarctica. Um, however, this only gives us a temporal snapshot in time of the subsurface conditions. When we think about these radar flight lines, they're often limited temporally you know, across seasons. Sometimes they're never even repeated. And they're very expensive, uh, especially across multiple field campaigns. So the other techniques that radio glaciologists like to use is stationary ground-based radar systems that can fill in those gaps and provide continuous observations at a single location. 
So here I'm showing an example of an AP res system that uh, I set up with University of Cambridge uh, to look at you know, internal uh, properties and internal layers and the changes of the internal layers, as well as changes of the bed conditions as a function of time. So here you can see that you can get very fine temporal resolution using base sensor radars at a single location. For example, you can use this temporal information to extract valuable glaciological measurements, such as basal mount rates, looking at thickness changes over time, and glacial water storage by tracking the changes in the power and looking at how this could be connected to, say, a subglacial drainage system. And then finally, looking at vertical velocities and the changes in, say, uplift or the changes in the layer positioning, again, as a function of time. Now, one thing to note, however, for these ground-based radar systems is that while we can deploy them really nicely when we first set them up, if we say come back a year later, you might find that a crevasse could open up underneath it. So there's these extreme conditions that ground-based radar systems face. And because of that, we want to try to reduce the cost of the system to make it less damaging if, say, we lose the system. And of course, the data was located in this box right here. So on one side, we have airborne radar sounders that can provide extensive spatial coverage by limited temporally to a snapshot time. And on the other hand, we have ground-based radar systems that can provide these nearly continuous observations, but can only do so at a single location. So this really shows the need for both spatial and temporal coverage. And current techniques right now are really resource intensive. When we think about the cost, the power, the size, and logistics for continuous long-term monitoring at the ice sheet scale. In both cases, these techniques are fundamentally limited by the need to transmit their own powerful electromagnetic signal. So that's where my work comes in, where uh, we've been developing a passive radar approach to monitoring glaciers. It eliminates the need to transmit a signal, and instead receives the sun's radio signals to provide these temporal and spatial observations of ice sheets, ice shelves, and glaciers. The idea is that a receiver sitting on the surface will receive, say, an ambient radio signal's direct path, such as the sun, as well as the path that propagates through the ice, reflects off the bed, and then is received a delayed time later. Then using autocorrelation-based techniques, you're able to extract the direct path signal, as well as this reflected signal that occurs a delay time later, which maps to an ice thickness measurement. The idea being this ambient radio source is essentially white noise, and because white noise should only match itself, you would get really sharp peaks in the autocorrelation, which is shown here with a simulation. Now, we did a bunch of uh, lab-based lab -based testing, uh, sensor development, simulations, and uh, tested our device both at Big Sur and at Death Valley before going to an ice sheet. But for the interest of time, I'll show our result at Store Glacier Greenland, where we used our technique uh, using a receiver sitting on the surface to measure the direct path, as well as the path that, again, propagates through the ice, reflects off the bed, and is then received a delay time later. So using the developed signal processing technique, we were able to extract an echo peak in the autocorrelation function at roughly 10.8 microseconds, which mapped to a nice thickness measurement of around 1,000 meters, which is what we expected based on using a Greenland ice sheet model, as well as active AP res radar measurement uh, near the test site, shown here in the red line, the range of those measurements. So now that we showed that this technique could work, one of the key questions is, what is the extent of passive sounding spatial and temporal coverage? When we think about those valuable glaciological measurements I showed before, such as melt rates, looking at glacial water storage and vertical strain rates, what is passive sounding's capability? And we used a performance analysis in order to determine the rate of spatial and temporal coverage. So we started by first projecting passive sounding performance in terms of the signal to noise ratio. We took in consideration all the attenuation, reflection, transmission, and scattering losses, as well as the amount of maximum integration time that is used to obtain the gain of our received signal. The idea being, if you can listen for a longer period of time, you can get a better estimate of what you're trying to record. So using this information, we then created a signal to noise ratio curve as a function of time of day, for our test site, in this case, I'm showing the example for Store Glacier Greenland. Now doing this for each location on the Greenland ice sheet, I'm showing signal to noise ratio maps for Greenland subsurface for three times of the year, the summer, the spring equinox, and the winter, where I'm showing, again, a signal to noise ratio, where the red is very strong signal to noise ratio, and blue is very low signal to noise ratio. And in general, signal to noise ratio is greater than 10 dB, this is a desirable for the radar measurements. 
So what you can see here is that in the winter case, the sun is below the horizon. And as we'd expect, the majority of the ice sheet is no longer observable using passive sounding. But in the summer months, it shows how passive sounding could be used for a wide range of the Greenland ice sheet to monitor the subsurface conditions. Performing the same analysis for Antarctica, again, I'm showing signal to noise ratio maps for two times of year, the summer and the spring equinox, as a function of the signal to noise ratio, where again, greater than 10, DD, 10 dB is what is desirable. What you'll notice immediately is that the ice shelves themselves pop out really bright, which is great and expected because if you think about the interface at the subsurface, it's an ice ocean interface instead of, say, an ice frozen bedrock. Uh, that would have, you know, more reflection and scattering losses than the ice ocean interface. So this shows that passive sounding could be really good for using on those ice shelves. Now looking at another time of year, right before the sun goes below the horizon, you can see that the signal to noise ratio significantly drops off. And again, this is expected as for the winter months, the signal to noise ratio would suffer when the sun is no longer available. So this motivated the second part of my talk, which is using other ambient radio sources, such as Jupiter's radio emissions, in order to try to increase the extent of passive soundings temporal coverage. But to wrap up the terrestrial part, when we think about passive radar sounding, it's a potentially cost-effective tool in order to provide continuous monitoring at the ice sheet scale. For the second part, again, I will look at exploring other ambient radio sources, such as Jupiter's radio emissions, for looking at Europa. So here I'm showing an example of the Europa Clipper mission going to Europa. And one of the instruments on board for the Europa Clipper mission is called the Radar for Europa Assessment and Sounding Ocean to Near Surface. So this radar has two different bands, a VHF at 60 megahertz, as well as an HF for deep probing at 9 megahertz. This VHF will be looking at, say, near surface features, whereas the HF, again, is trying to do deep probing to potentially detect a liquid ocean beneath Europa's icy shell. However, this HF has one uh, major problem, mainly being at 9 megahertz. It's in the same frequency band as Jupiter's radio emissions, which you could think of as just a very loud uh, background source, background source that could potentially obscure any measurements that we're trying to make. What I mean is if you were to look at the strength of Jupiter's radio emissions, compared to just, say, the galactic background noise, you can see that Jupiter is a very noisy source that's over five orders of magnitude greater than this galactic background noise. So it'll potentially act as a jammer in an HF band for your radar system. Looking at what this might uh, manifest itself experimentally, if you were to, say, look at the HF radar for the noise freeze case, and you're trying to detect surface features as shown here, you can easily detect that in the noise freeze case. But if Jupiter is on and acting as that jamming signal, you can no longer observe those surface features. So this presents a problem. But instead of fighting Jupiter's radio emissions, one of my co-authors suggested, what if instead we use Jupiter's radio emissions as a source for passive sounding of Europa? The idea being very similar to before. You receive Jupiter's direct path, as well as the path that reflects off of the icy surface, as well as the ice ocean interface and then use an autocorrelation-based technique, since Jupiter is noise, to extract these direct path signals, reflections from the surface, as well as these subsurface reflections, using that to gain altimetric information, as well as potentially detect that global subsurface ocean. So we want to simulate what this might look like. We create uh, what's known as SAR, synthetic aperture radar imaging, in order to do this. I'm going to quickly show the results of the simulation, but if you're interested in more of the details, I can show them afterwards. Before these simulations, we're interested in trying to, say, look at being able to observe and recreate a synthetic DEM using passive SAR uh, focusing. So the idea is we have some sensor geometry flying over Europa's surface. It's receiving an incoming plane wave coming from Jupiter's radio emissions, reflecting off of Europa's surface, and then being received by the receiver. This receiver, again, is flying over some synthetic DEM. Here I'm showing the track. And it's going to try to recreate this ground track where you're looking at the side view of the ridge. Showing the results of the simulation for this passive radar case. On the left is what's known as the range compressed image. So this is before you do synthetic aperture radar. This is just the first initial result. As you can see, it's very noisy in terms of signal to noise ratio, which is expected given that we're using
uh, parameters based on the rhyme and reason instrument. These are actually not designed for passive sounding. These are designed for active radar. So you're just using what's given to you with in terms of noise. But what this highlights is after you perform the synthetic aperture radar imaging uh, focusing technique, this can improve the signal to noise ratio and allow you to detect those uh, surface features as well as near surface features using just ambient radio noise as your source. So going forward, I'm interested in a wide range of uh, processes, both in terms of signal processing, radar system design, modeling these radar performances, and then looking at mission concepts such as one that I described um, before. But for the rest of the talk, I'm going to highlight some of the work of my students uh, that have been working with me the past couple of months. So the first project that one of my students is working on is solving the direct path problem in passive sounding. So it turns out that this direct signal is actually one of the largest sources of your noise in your measurement. What I mean is the direct path signal is so much greater than the reflected path that when you perform the passive measurement that I was telling you about, this direct path acts as a huge source of interference. So the idea is if you take a direct signal suppression approach, you can actually remove that direct path interference in order to increase the signal to noise ratio, which will allow you to obtain better glaciological measurements. So here I'm showing the result before using the direct signal suppression technique. And then on the bottom, I'm showing the result after applying direct signal suppression, which shows that you can get a very large gain in signal to noise ratio, which again is great when you're thinking about the range of spatial and temporal coverage. Another project that one of my students was working on is trying to recreate uh, the sun experiment that I was talking about, but instead using Jupiter's radio emissions as a source for detection. Now, glaciers are hard to get to. So right now we're pro proposing to test this at Dante's view in Death Valley, where the idea is you would measure the direct path uh, to the side of the cliff, as well as the path that reflects off of the desert floor and then is received a delay time later, where the desert floor would be analogous to, say, the rough surface of the bed of an ice sheet. Another project is looking at well, what is, say, a maximum usable altitude for a sensor that is, say, trying to do passive radar sounding at Europa? The idea being, when we consider these ambient radio sources, they have some source spread, and this will cause some blurring in the, say, autocorrelation-based technique. So this analysis uh, stems from the von sidert zernick theorem and looks at what is the maximum usable altitude for passive radar sounding as a function of your radar wavelength as well as your platform's bistatic angle. And so what we found is that in the case of passive radar sounding at Europa, your maximum altitude is gonna be limited, especially when you think about the range of usable altitudes at Europa to say bistatic angles that are less than 30 degrees. This is another type of analysis on the right, which is called pulse broadening. This looks at the spread of your echo peak and the autocorrelation function. And what this shows is that the delay smear, or again, that number of samples spread in the autocorrelation, isn't too significant, which is great, meaning that passive sounding can work in terms of the pulse broadening limitations. The main limitation being this source spread one that I showed on the left. And the final project that I wanted to highlight from one of my students is looking at solar radio burst candidates for passive sounding at Mars. So the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has what's known as a Sharad shallow radar that has been uh, detecting potential solar radio bursts. And the idea is perhaps we can use these solar radio bursts detected by Sharad as a source for passive sounding at Mars. Again, being a low resource approach where you're not transmitting a signal, you're just receiving ambient radio waves, in this case, solar radio bursts, uh, in order to perform passive sounding. So with that, uh, to conclude my talk, starting from theory, simulation lab bench, testing my research demonstrate passive radar sounding, using the sun as a radio source to measure ice sheet thickness for the first time. Passive radar sounding could enable continuous and widespread monitoring of Antarctica and Greenland subsurface conditions and serve as a low resource sensor to probe the icy moons of Jupiter. My current research is focusing on providing a richer understanding of the technique by projecting ambient noise passive radar performance and potential limitations when designing future radar sounding missions. With that, I'd like to acknowledge all my co-authors and collaborators, especially my students here at the Naval Postgraduate School, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Um, as I said before, we're going to keep the questions to the end of the three presentations. Um, so we'll move on to our third presentation, which is from Morgan Say, 
Um, Morgan recently completed her PhD at the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of Cambridge, uh, where she researched the social, socio cultural, and political aspects of Antarctic science, focusing on gender. She's currently uh, working on a SCAR fellowship in uh, the US, and her talk for us today is going to be entitled Inequality on the Ice, the Past, Present and Future of Women in Antarctic Science. So if we could get you to share your screen, Morgan. Hey, thank you so much for that, Debbie, and thank you, everybody, uh, for having me. I, I want to mention just at the start that um, some of you might know me as the Global Mountains Director for the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative, or ICCI. Um, and that is the, the hat that I wear uh, most of the time these days, but I want to emphasize that I'm not here representing ICCI. Instead, I've been asked to speak about um, my research on gender inequality in Antarctic science, which is distinct from, but has lots of overlaps with glaciology worldwide, and I've been specifically asked to speak about how we got to the point that we are today and what lessons the past has for us in the future. I'm also going to focus on the US and the UK as examples uh, because those are the case studies that I have the most data from. And so uh, let's start by getting everybody on the same page then. Um, you may have heard that two reports recently came out from the US and Australia about sexual harassment in Antarctic fieldwork. The reports are appalling, um, but they are not surprising, and they received significant media attention and spurred important conversations among Antarctic scientists. You may have heard that in the US report, 72% of women reported that sexual harassment is a problem in the Antarctic research community, but unfortunately only 48% of men reported it as a problem, and more strikingly, only 40% of leadership did, regardless of their gender. And I'm going to briefly highlight just three quotes that came out of this report and the ensuing press coverage. Every woman I knew down there had an assault or harassment experience that had occurred on the ice. The unwritten rule ever since I started in the 1990s has been to keep your mouth shut or you will be blacklisted. Sexual harassment and assault are a fact of life here, just like the fact that Antarctica is cold and the wind blows. I think it's fairly clear that this is a major and systemic problem that needs to be addressed urgently. And the Australian report also found widespread harassment and predatory cultures on Antarctic stations, which supports previous findings by the report's author, Dr. Meredith Nash, from this paper presented here, which found that 63% of women in Australian Antarctic fieldwork had experienced sexual harassment and that it also was underreported in that case. And that same Australian study also identified other important structural barriers faced by women in the field, including physical barriers, caring responsibilities and unpaid work, cultural sexism and gender bias, and lack of opportunities and recognition. Again, these are clearly serious, widespread systemic problems that need to be addressed. But it also really shouldn't come as a surprise that these um, barriers exist because uh, the fact of persistent gender inequality in Antarctic research is backed up by a ton of research and community dialogue going back decades from countries around the world. They've also been highlighted through community dialogues from the Me Too movement to EDI initiatives in, in many of the institutions that we all work at. And I want to highlight as well that all of this research makes clear that the structural barriers in Antarctic research and other scientific fields do not only affect women, although that's the focus of my talk, um, but they also have pronounced effects on non-binary people, people of color, the LGBTQI plus community, people with disabilities, and other historically excluded groups, and especially for people whose identities span more than one of these groups, which is what we talk about when we call for intersectional um, change, if you've heard the phrase intersectionality. But again, today I've been asked to speak about how we got to this place where women face such a wide range of barriers in Antarctic research. And it, it's quite a striking history. So to begin again, we'll get on the same page. Uh, men have been conducting science in Antarctica for over 100 years, since the so-called heroic age of Antarctic exploration. But women across the board were categorically barred from conducting research in Antarctica through most of the 20th century. Not a single woman scientist was permitted to work in the Antarctic region at all until 1956, when the Soviets included women on an Antarctic research vessel. And then the first Argentinian women to work on the continent did so in 1968. The U.S. barred women from its Antarctic research stations until 1969. 
Australia barred women until 1974, and the UK barred women until 19, excuse me, 83. And then on top of that, the UK, the US kept some field opportunities closed to women until 1979, and the UK did so until 1996. But I want to be clear that this never had anything to do with women's lack of interest or their lack of effort. Capable and extremely qualified women had been trying to join Antarctic expeditions, in fact, since the early 20th century. For example, Ernest Shackleton left behind the record of three sporty girls whose application he rejected. They wrote, we do not see why men should have all the glory and women none, especially when there are women just as brave and capable as there are men. Dozens of women also applied to join Richard Byrd in Antarctica in the 1920s and 30s, including women who Byrd acknowledged were clearly capable and qualified. In fact, Byrd wrote to one woman that uh, while he had no doubt about her capability, she simply couldn't join because of the public relations nightmare that would ensue if she did. And in 1937, when a new British Antarctic expedition was proposed, a newspaper reported that 1,300 women had applied to join but all were denied on the basis of their sex. So I want to think for a moment about the quote at the top of the screen here about how Byrd rejected these women because of public opinion. And that was not a superficial excuse. Public opinion was in fact central to Antarctic exploration. Explorers put enormous effort and resources into crafting compelling and sensational expedition narratives. Even though for most expeditioners, life on the ice was often mundane or tedious. Um, people spent a lot of time on tasks like cooking and cleaning uh, that would not have been considered terribly masculine, let alone heroic back home. But there were huge financial incentives for explorers to focus on themes of heroic masculinity. That heroic narrative supported nationalist ideals and upheld the exploration cultures on which the entire profession of exploration relied. It's what got the explorer sponsorship, sponsorship from governments, from private companies, um, from public audiences. And so telling these sensational and heroic stories was really a central part of their profession. It, it was their lifeblood. And importantly, to gain the greatest rewards from those narratives, the stories the explorers told needed to paint a picture of Antarctic exploration as an exclusive activity, not one that just anybody could do, and particularly not women. And I'll highlight as well, this was not just the case in the Antarctic, but also in places like the Arctic and high mountain areas where many glaciologists work and did at the time. But moving forward into the mid 20th century, when national Antarctic programs were uh, started to be established, women began applying to conduct field work from the start, but they found themselves barred from the field year after year. Some of these women, like the three that I've shown here, were exceptionally capable and qualified. For example, the woman on the left, Dr. Mary Bell Allen, um, was a world famous American microbiologist who had significant experience in field work in remote and extreme environments and was also an expert in mountaineering and snow and ice camping. On the surface, women were denied access to Antarctic field work on the grounds that there were simply no facilities for women in the field. And in her oral history, a British geologist named Janet Thompson remembers a letter of rejection that a friend of hers received. It said that there were no facilities for women in the Antarctic, i.e. there was not a separate toilet, there were no shops, there were no hairdressers. And that same no facilities excuse was also used to keep women out of other remote and extreme environments such as research vessels, mountain observatories, Arctic field stations, and NASA's astronaut corps. But the no facilities excuse masked deeper concerns about social stability and sexuality in these remote and extreme environments. Leaders were worried that men in the field would be distracted by women, they would compete for women's affections, become jealous of one another, and destabilize these isolated, precariously balanced station communities in their view. So in the 1980s, former BAS director Vivian Fuchs said, should it happen one day that women are included as part of the base complement, problems will certainly arise and lead to the breakdown of that sense of unity, which is so important. And Admiral George Defec, who led the US Navy's science support efforts in the Antarctic in the 50s, once claimed that women will not be allowed in the Antarctic until we can provide one woman for every man. And unfortunately, that impulse to control women's opportunities in order to control men's bad behavior is something that continues across field science. Um, and it's also something we see in other male-dominated fields. 
But all of these concerns also were underpinned by deeper ideological anxieties. Um, and essentially, Antarctic leaders were worried that women's presence would feminize the world's harshest continent, that women might prove life on the ice to be relatively safe and mundane, uh, revealing it to be a place that was no better suited to heroic white men than to anybody else, um, that if these exclusionary heroic narratives were undermined, that might damage morale on station or decrease men's interest in working on the ice, and once again diminish um, the public support that was still so important to funding Antarctic work. And I want to be clear that this is not conjecture by the research community. This is explicitly clear in the archives. For example, in 1959, Admiral Dufek was quoted saying that women's presence would wreck the illusion of being frontiersmen going into a new land and the illusion of being a hero. And women working in Antarctic research also recognize this tension. Um, I'm sure many of you know Dr. Elizabeth Morris, who is one of glaciology's great scientists and pioneering women. And in her oral history, she reflected on some men's resistance to her presence in the field in the 1980s, saying, perhaps they thought that if a middle-aged woman with no particular physical skills could do it, how could they be heroes? The fact is that this exclusionary narrative from the early days of Antarctic exploration had strongly influenced cultures of Antarctic science, and I'm sure many of you recognize them today from throughout glaciology. And they continue to center white, non-disabled, cisgender men in Antarctic science, which means re reinforcing the marginalization of women and other historically excluded groups. But the takeaway, I think, from this history of exclusion is that women, um, the exclusion of women was not inevitable. It was not an inherent aspect of Antarctic fieldwork. It took work to keep women out and preser to preserve the myth that Antarctica was somehow inherently a place for men. But things did eventually change, and I want to briefly wrap up with a story of change. Um, there were lots of factors that contributed to progress. Of course, the mid 20th century was an era of sweeping social change um, in many Western countries in particular, with national governments moving toward equal employment opportunities for women. And that put social, political, and legal pressure on programs like BAS and USAP to reconsider their policies on women. Also throughout the 70s and 80s, an increasing number of women were earning science degrees, which meant that more applications for field work from women, more pressure from PIs, mostly men, um, who wanted to send their female graduate students to the field. There were also cohorts of women who could come together, support one another, see patterns in the issues they were facing and realize it was not an issue of them specifically, but rather a structural issue that they were facing together and advocate for change. And there was also a growing sentiment among young women in the field, I'm sorry, among young men in the field, um, that sharing space for women in the field might be normal, that it might not be problematic, and it might even be enjoyable to have a greater diversity of perspectives, experiences, and personalities in the field. And a final and very significant factor was the continuous pressure that was applied by women and male, male allies. For some women, this meant patiently but persistently submitting applications for field work, making sure that program managers knew they were ready and willing to work in the field and that their top quality science required it. For others, it meant directly petitioning National Antarctic programs. For example, in the 1980s, one woman wrote to Bass, perhaps you feel our crinoline petticoats will inhi inhibit our research. If, however, you have discovered a major biological factor why females cannot live in tents, I am sure that the science world as a whole will be most intrigued to hear from you. And one male Antarctic scientist argued to his peers, we are virtually condemning ourselves to second-rate scientists if we don't start considering women on an equal basis to men. Women also petitioned government in some cases. In the US, one woman wrote to Congress, and in the UK, one woman wrote directly to Margaret Thatcher, although those were not terribly successful. But women also threatened to sue national Antarctic programs in both the US and the UK, and that was actually quite successful. And because of this combination of factors, change did gradually begin to happen. As more women entered Antarctic programs, they started to uh, join forces with their colleagues to tackle sexist field cultures, from a lack of appropriate bathroom facilities to rampant pornography. They recruited other women to work in the field, and they established networks that provided sources of belonging, support, and professional advancement. 
And also, um, as more and more women took on leadership roles in the 1980s and 90s, they sometimes worked behind the scenes to, dismantled, uh, to dismantle institutional barriers, although they often did so quietly because they did not want to jeopardize their jobs, which they feared would happen if they were perceived as too feminist or um, too stroppy, too activist, so on and so forth. So forth. And so thanks to, to these women and their allies in the field, we have lots to celebrate about women's achievements and contributions in Antarctic science. And yet it's not a tidy story of, of progress. We haven't reached the end of the story, far from it. As these recent studies underscore, women continue to face serious barriers, which are deeply harmful for women, and they're also damaging to scientific progress. There is tons of research available, peer-reviewed literature that shows that more diverse and inclusive teams produce better science. Um, they answer some of the hardest questions at a higher quality. They, um, they are able to find better solutions to the challenges that we're facing in our fields. And I also want to say that until recently, um, many people had really only heard positive stories about um, the, the history of progress towards women equality, that the field was a really excellent place for people to be. And I want to highlight from a historical perspective that lots of women who had bad experiences left the field. Some chose to leave because it wasn't welcoming. Some were pushed out of the field um, and others chose to stay, stay silent about negative experiences because that was what they felt was necessary to protect their jobs. Not to say that's everybody, but there are people whose stories we have. We'll just wrap up with a quick summary of what I think the key messages are from this history. One is that the past exclusion of women was not inevitable or inherent to Antarctic science. It was always contested and it took work to change, just like progress continues to take work today. And I hope that everybody is, um, is willing and able to contribute to that process. Second is that change was not inevitable. It took hard work, like I said. And I think I need to correct the first piece that I said, that the exclusion of women took work and so did progress take work. And I hope that everybody is on board today to, to create progress and to change our institutions to become more inclusive. I hope that word slip was, was clear. And finally, that then and now, creating meaningful and lasting change required work at the levels of policy, practice, and culture. And that includes changes to the ways that we talk about Antarctic science, those heroic narratives. It's, it's time to, to center the fact that people of all identities and backgrounds can, should, and do contribute to our fields. They work from sites ranging to remote glaciers to computer labs. They do lots of different kinds of work in collaboration with one another. And I think that's something that we can all celebrate. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for putting up this slide just to advertise the next seminar uh, for next week, uh, which will be Fabienne Masson um, talking about climate policy and climate change and the multi-century legacy of delayed mitigation. But let's move on to questions for today's speaker, speakers. Um, try and um, get everyone up there visible. If you have a question that you would like to ask, if you could indicate in the chat um, and then we can um, get you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, I think we have some speakers, uh, some sorry, some viewers also on Facebook, so I'll keep an eye there. Um, so um, does anyone have any questions? Perhaps Oh, Roger, do you want to go ahead first? Yes. Yep, thanks very much. And first of all, thank you to all three speakers. And for Morgan, I was trying to find the reaction, uh, the reaction emoji for a big blush, but, but well done. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, my question actually specifically is, is for Sean, uh, which was that really interesting talk. I wonder if you could say something about what kind of resolution in in terms of um, time variant changes and so on you might perhaps be able to find with your surface monitoring because obviously you're going to you're talking about putting an instrument at one spot and leaving it there for a while and therefore you you want to do that somewhere um, maybe more productively than just getting a single spot height and moving on yes yes exactly so if you remember the ap res example that i showed you that was doing about every six hours the idea being the passive radar system would provide essentially the same temporal resolution every 
six hours or so. The measurement that I was showing was using eight seconds of integration time. And then I was receiving across multiple files and then averaging those files to improve the signal to noise ratio. So that process took roughly about 30 minutes, uh, but that was just because I was post-processing. You can imagine onboard processing to speed up that process. The last thing I'll say for this question is that, again, the AP REST system does a really great job for monitoring at, say, the hourly scales. I think that passive air sound could do that as well. Thank you. Inga, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, yeah, I'm also happy for you to read it out. <laughs> yeah, so Morgan, thank you. That was great. I'm just wondering what the next piece of hard work is that needs to be done on gender equality in Antarctic science, because I'm in the New Zealand program and I know Gillian Ratt, when she was chief executive of Antarctic New Zealand, put in um, some quite sensible um, moves that other national Antarctic programs are only seeming to be thinking about now. So I'm just wondering how much coordination there is on this issue amongst the national Antarctic programs in terms of logistics and field work. That's a great question. I'm actually on uh, SCAR's uh, equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, what are we at the moment? I think we're in action group um, newly formed this year. Um, so SCAR is working on this. Comnap also has a working group on EDI issues. Uh, it's been raised increasingly actually in the Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings by a number of countries. I think we're between five and 10 countries have, have raised gender and other diversity related issues um, during the meetings lately. So it's something that just in the last few years has been gaining traction. And there is beginning to be more coordination or I should say more interest in coordination, particularly because we are such an international field. People come from one program, work at another under the supervision of yet another person. Um, and that's the same in the Arctic. It's the same in many Many high mountain areas um, and it's one of the greatest challenges as well because in these international settings we deal with um, not only differences in national policies but also in cultural norms in what's considered normal and acceptable versus what's considered unacceptable uh, so we're at the very earliest stages of that in most cases um, but i would encourage you um, if you are interested to uh, reach out to, to scar get involved in that edi um, working group it is open to everybody um, and uh and also, I think that with these two fairly impactful studies that have just come out from the US and Australian programs, uh, that's spurring a lot of uh, concern at the highest levels and interest in, in learning best practices from one another. So I'm hopeful that that will be the start of um, perhaps a, a, a new stage in making progress on these issues. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to jump to a question from Facebook from Helen Fricker. Um, she asks, how do we ensure the safety of every person in Antarctica? I would say that Helen Fricker is one of the voices that I would turn to for the answer to that question. Um, uh, Helen is, is somebody who I who I continue to learn a lot from, although I don't think we've actually met, but I, I follow a lot of your work. Um, I there's no one answer to any of these questions is is the fact of the matter there's a lot that needs to happen like i said policy practice and culture and i think that that policy is one of the hardest ones to change because it's really people who have authority in leadership positions who are able to change it but culture is one of the ones that's least sort of attended to because it can feel invisible it's the water that we swim in um, one thing that i would highlight um which helen i, I know that, that you are somebody who, who talks about this a lot is how essential it is to have um, reporting structures in place that are actually meaningful, that people feel that they can report what happens, that allies understand how to support, you know, bystander support, that kind of thing, and that the institutions then take that information and act on it so that it's not a black hole of information where, where people are worried about coming forward, um, either because it might damage their lives or careers or because it might serve no purpose. I think that reporting and then acting on what's reported is essential, but there are laundry lists of things that have to happen. And in the Australian report, I think that Meredith Nash has actually outlined quite a bit of that, as well as in a piece for the conversation um, that she wrote. If you want to Google that, she's got a lovely bullet point list at the end of sort of key actions that Antarctic institutions can take. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, Marin and Helen both have a very similar question, actually, again to you, Morgan, um, basically asking how, how we get uh, Helen 
phrases it as how do we get our male colleagues into this space and Marin is asking how we make sure it's not just the marginalized groups that have to do the work to change the culture and policy but also white male allies essentially the same question from both of them i i feel that question very much and we held um uh, a workshop at the scar osc a few months ago um that was a, a really successful um workshop however it was uh, very heavily dominated by women's voices and and also then some people of color and, and women of color as well um it, it is a problem i think that uh, one thing that is helpful is exactly what tavia has done here which is to bring these kinds of stories into forums where they uh, i'm sorry not just stories but these kinds of discussions into forums where they aren't often found to make sure that people are hearing them um and understanding why they're so important and uh what the role of allies has been and has to continue to be um we also really need to to reach leadership in in a new way and that means not just you know leaders of national antarctic programs but pis people leading labs and institutes departments and that sort of thing um and that is hard to do and i, I hate to say i don't have a, a clear answer for that except to say that we all i think need to keep pushing on this because it's too much of a burden. And you saw in the, the Nash paper that I highlighted that unpaid responsibilities are one of the barriers to, to women's success. And the same goes to other marginalized and historically excluded groups. It takes a lot of labor to, to try to do this work, to create change. Uh, it's almost never compensated. And that takes away from what people are able to put into this, um, into the work of their, you know, their primary careers of, of doing their science. And so I'd highlight one thing, for example, that people can do is to amplify the work that marginalized people are already doing. You can look at women in polar science, at pride in polar research, at accessibility in polar research, at polar impact. Um, these are groups that are that have formed in order to do the work. And um, by amplifying what they do, learning from them, attending their webinars, retweeting their tweets, all of this kind of thing, we can at least, while that doesn't take away their work, we can make sure that it's having the impact that it can have. And then we need people in leadership positions, especially those who are not in by the kinds of structural barriers that historically excluded groups are, um, white, non-disabled men especially, um, to understand these issues, to read about them, to listen to seminars like this, and um, and to, to continue listening and asking so that they can then pull the levers that they have unique access to as um, people who are influential and who are not facing the same barriers as others. Fantastic. Thank you. Julian, do you want to ask? You've got a question for Sean, I see. Uh, yes, thank you for all the talks and thank you, Morgan. Uh, I had a question for Sean about SAR. Um, <clears throat> I was asking if the SAR was single complex and uh, what frequency you were using. So what layers of the IC you were expecting to be able to see in Europe or probably even in Insulados if you end up looking at that eventually. And um, there's some scree deposits that I've I've seen about in some of the craters in Mars. Do you expect that the SAR should be able to pick those up as well or even be able to start being able to tell where the origin of that the scree deposits were from? That's like three questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Uh, I'm not sure about that last one, but I can answer the SAR questions. So we were using our parameters uh, based off of the rhyme and reason instrument. So the center frequency was actually nine megahertz. Uh, the receiver bandwidth was one megahertz. So that resolution you know, really is gonna be about 150 meters of resolution. If you look at the ridge that I was showing, mm. What happens is once you uh, use synthetic aperture radar imaging, that starts to improve your resolution, which is what we were finding. Um, and in this case, we're using, again, that phase history, which is part of that single look complex data that you were talking about in order to uh, obtain this measurement. So this is just a single one. This is not using you know, single uh, complex after, the, after like multiple passes. This is just one snapshot of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've just got one question for Morgan, if that's uh, acceptable, um, which is that I was intrigued to see that the um, attendance data at a couple of the most recent IGS seminar, uh, sorry, no, IGS um, conferences, 
actually for early career researchers was more than 50% women. So uh, there were actually more women present than men uh, for early career um, researchers. And I was just interested to, to have you think forward maybe 10 years. Do you think this, this is going to cause a huge sea change in, in glaciology? Um, or do you think the leaky pipeline will continue to leak too much and our early career, career researchers will all, all just be lost? Um, I really hate to uh, not have an optimistic answer there. Um, it's been a long time that we've had a lot of uh, women early career researchers and not a lot of women at the most senior levels. Um, you know, the, the leaky pipeline is an issue, but part of the issue is the pipe itself. You know, the pipe has not been created in an inclusive way. It was designed for a specific type of, of person to forge a specific type of career. We need really systemic change in order to, to keep women in the field. Um, and anecdotally, I know a lot of the women in my peer group have left the research community. Um, you can look at, at me, for example, I'm uh, finishing up a SCAR fellowship. I've finished my PhD at Cambridge. I've moved into science policy as my as my day job uh, right now. Um, I think that it's it's really not enough for for us to to hope that the numbers of of early career women we see is going to translate into into change that we really need to address the structural problems that are so taken for granted within our organizations and make sure that um, we're changing like i said policies have to change but so practices the way the things that are normalized the cultures that are considered acceptable all of that absolutely has to change in order for those women as well as members of other marginalized and historically group, excluded groups not just to want to be in the field but to want to stay in the field to feel safe enough to stay in the field to be able to stay in the field without having you know experiencing the kind of violence that a lot of people have Thank you. And uh, I think we'll finish with a question for Alexandra from Roger. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Hello again, Alexandra. Thanks again for your talk. Um, seems a while ago after these these two other exciting ones as well. Does does your work kind of put a a, a kind of depth profile on the the time scale of atmospheric climatological variations that we should consider? You, uh, recoverable then and apologies for a naive question from a from a geophysicist um but it just it struck me you were showing a lot of variability near the surface trying to decide on what kind of depth range it's stabilized and is there then a depth threshold below which we should not try and recover x y or z time scale of things that's a perfect question that's very um the core of what we're trying to figure out but it's also very tricky so it always depends on your accumulation rate if you have a high enough accumulation rate like you have on um, in western Antarctica or on the Antarctic Peninsula then you can actually go down to annual resolution or potentially also see seasonal changes but if you're more in the plateau regions where you don't have melt like on the Greenland ice sheet or in the eastern Arctic plateau it gets more tricky because on top of what we have of um, accumulation intermittency, you then have diffusion, which is um, destroying your annual signal completely. So in the best case, you can go down to centennial and maybe decadal scale. And there are a lot of statistical efforts to like back diffuse your diffuse time series to go back to an annual resolution or actually seasonal. Um, but I wouldn't trust it because if we know now if we had a summer or a winter signal or when our precipitation occurs that doesn't mean that in the last interglacial or glacial periods that we had the same accumulation patterns uh, throughout the year so there are a lot of assumptions always um, if you want to look at really high temperature resolution um, ideally if you want to really resolve it then having several cores next to each other and then seeing how strong the variability is and um, statistically making a stack, but I know that for deep ice cores, it's not possible to get replicates. Um, but I guess it's a good step that if we learn at the surface what's happening, that we can then extrapolate it to other timescales. Yep, smashing, thank you. Well, thank you very much to all three speakers and thank you very much to the audience, both here and on Facebook. Um, 
A reminder that next week's seminar is from Fabian Marcion from the University of Innsbruck. Uh, he'll be talking on climate policy and climate change, the long legacy of delayed mitigation action. So look forward to seeing you all again next week. Watch out. There will be another hour shift next week for most countries who haven't already changed the hour. Um, we'll still be on uh, GMT here, but of course you'll change back to the usual time for most people. Or for people in the Southern Hemisphere, it will get uh, an hour better um, if you're an early morning watcher. So thank you very much to everyone and uh, look forward to seeing everyone again next week.